you. I want you to turn to your neighbor, someone you don't know. This is going to be awkward. And you're going to give them the biggest high five known to man. On my count, ready? One, two, three. Yes. Oh, boom. I love it. I grew up playing sports. I was that musty kid that you saw playing around with the twigs and berries in their hair that you would say, what have you been doing all day? That was me. I loved playing sports. I ran track. I played soccer. I did everything possible. So one day, I look, and kitty corner to my house was a rec center. And they had football and cheerleading registration. So I walk over there, and I'm like, I want to try out for football. And they look at me, they're like, you, you can do cheerleading. I was like, no, I want to do football. They're like, well, go get your mom. And people who have kids, I was actually the perfect kid you wanted. 50% determination and 50% stubbornness. So I walked over, grabbed my mom, said, Mom, come on, let's go. She comes over there, and I'm like, Mom, I want to play football. So she looks at the guy, and she's like, well, let her play football. <laughs> so this was me, and this is probably my mom's favorite picture of me, and I'm 38. So, yeah, Mom, you guys understand that. So after that, I went on to high school. I ran track, played football, played volleyball, and I was lucky enough that volleyball was my vehicle out. I played volleyball in college for four years. And after that, I went, to, after that I went and I coached for 15 glorious years with one of the most amazing experiences being that I was able to coach in the 2011 Division I National Volleyball Championship. Thank you, but unfortunately we lost. And, you know, as sports fans, you understand how it is to watch your team who lost on the floor, and the winning team is running around, sprinting, cutting down the nets, and cheering. Well, I'm going to tell you from personal experience, there is nothing worse than being on the floor while those teams are running around, cutting nets, and there is blue and gold confetti dropping in your afro. And so after eight years, I'm still bitter at UCLA. <laughs> it won't go away. So after that experience, I got, to coach for, I got to coach at university for four more years and coach some amazing human beings. And during that time, I started to listen and hearing the intersection of race and athletics. So I was born in Canada. I was raised for the first 10 years undocumented in Arizona. I grew up in Yuma, Arizona, which is five minutes from the Mexico border, in a majority-minority city. And so during that time, my teammates, I always had at least one or two black teammates, Tons of Latinx teammates. And then when I went to college, the same thing. At least one or two black teammates, tons of other teammates from Brazil and different ethnicities and races. So hearing my student athletes of color talk about their experience as a predominantly white institution was just something I'd never really experienced, of being the only one. Of being the only one maybe on their team or even in the athletic department. So I started listening to them. And as I was listening, I started to hear what the other athletes of color were talking about. You know, stories of walking up to a party and hearing, don't let those ends in. Of another experience of a student in the class said a racial slur, and the professor did nothing, just kept on with the lesson plan. Another experience of white teammates singing a song with the N-word and looking directly at their teammate of color. Or lastly, these athletes of color who had to hear racial slurs from people in the audience when they are playing, from the opponent's fans. So I'm hearing all these issues occurring. And what concerned me most was when I talked to coaches, their response was, well, I didn't hear anything, so I thought everything was fine. Instead of the opposite, which is, I recruited these student athletes of color to a predominantly white institution. I need to know what's going on. I need to know what their experiences are like. So I was listening to this type of thing and knowing that they didn't have anybody to talk to. Not coaches, not staff members, not administrators, nobody. And so I did what any normal person would do, right? I quit my career of 15 years. That's normal. And I told my mom, and she was like, but you don't have a job. I'm like, I know, this is great. <laughs> so I really, I started my social justice firm, and the reason was because I wanted to have, help student athletes have a better experience and I wanted to help administrations and athletic departments have more 
productive conversations about race so that they can help their student athletes of color. That was important to me. And so now, one of the things was, was that we have to look at the data. Why was it so tough for these student athletes of color to talk to coaches, staff members, administrators? In the 2011 Sport, Race, and Gender report by Dr. Richard Labcheck, he came out with this data across Division I through Division III. For male sport coaches, 88.6 of them are white. For female sport coaches, 87.4% are white. For athletic directors, Division I through three, 88.9% are white. Associate and assistant athletic directors, 88.7% white. And then lastly, the sport information directors, these are the people that control the message and the media for our athletes and athletes of color. Well, what are they? 94.5% white. So we have to think about this, especially when we're seeing that there are some sports that student athletes of color are over 50%. It's so bad that in Division III, there are more women coaching men's sports than there are African-American men coaching male sports. And there ain't a lot of women coaching male sports. I'll tell you that. So think of those numbers. And so the most amazing thing about athletics is that it's literally a diversity cauldron. You have people that they're playing with that they would have never played with before if it wasn't for athletics. People from different races, ethnicities, religions, socioeconomic statuses, family structures. This is why it's amazing to do social justice within athletics. Because also, you're going to be doing this work with people that you consider family. People you would literally run through the wall that these athletes are putting their body on the line for day in and day out. And so one of the cool things about doing it with your family is that we can work on vulnerability, empathy, understanding, giving the ability to make mistakes, sometimes big ones, because you're within family. And so we need to make this radical. And how do we make it radical, you ask? Well, it's time to bring everyone to the table. Because what we see in athletics is we tend to see that the top administration does their social justice workshops. The staff and students, excuse me, the staff and coaches do their workshop. And then the student athletes do their workshops. And where is the bulk of the work go to? The student athletes. But understand that just because I'm using athletics as my foundation, this is also happening in K through 12. Board of directors, okay? University and college administrations, nonprofits. So this is still happening at those places. And so it's so important to bring people down to the table, okay? Telling these administrators, it's time to get down, clip off your tie, take off your heels, wear sweats. Because if you come in a power suit, it makes a power dynamic. And we need to think about those things. It's important for these coaches, staff members, administrators to come down because they hear the voice of their student athletes firsthand about their experiences, about what's going on with their team in their athletic department. These student athletes get to see their coaches, staff members, and administrators in a totally different way. They hear their stories. They see where their experience is paralleled. And they get to see their humanity, which is most important. Because when we see the humanity in everyone, we start to change. And coming down to the table is a small thing that can create a huge impact. And that's what we have to think about. We start off with a high five. We have physical contact, eye connection. We're in a totally different place. And that's what we want to see start to happen. And so the main thing is that this presence creates so much change. And so. We have to just keep that in mind whenever we do things. When we do social justice, when we do anything, how important is our presence? We have that discomfort we go together through. Okay, we think about our biases. We work through our vulnerability together. 
We work through that stuff together. And so the main thing is that we're all a team. And as long as we're all a team and we all work together, we can not only create change, we can win. And so now, I give you all homework, because we're at university. So you get homework today. So the first thing is, ask yourself, how important is my presence at the table? How important is my boss's presence at the table? My administration's, table at, my administration's presence at the table? How important is that? Number two, stop reading all the leadership books. Exchange it for an equity book, a book on anti-racism, a book on racist thoughts. Really change the books you read because you're going to become a better leader if you read different books. The third thing, start building relationships with cultural centers. See this administration, go to different cultural centers, have their meetings there, start getting to know the amazing people who work there, the resources. Change that up because the cultural centers are such an invaluable resource many people don't use, especially in athletic administrations. And the main thing, the number one thing that we need to start doing and hold our administrations accountable to doing is to be at the table, y'all. That's the most important thing. So we started with the high five, and we're going to end with one. So look at another neighbor, someone you don't know. On the count of three, you're going to give them a massive high five. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.